Hello there. My name is Minister Barton Aaron Porter, and today we're going to continue our study of the great book of 1 Corinthians with the 14th chapter. Now, I'm going to be using the good old King James Version of the Bible, as I always do. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out and to study along with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 Verse 1, the Apostle Paul, being guided by the Spirit of God, continues to write, saying, follow after charity. Now, we learned in our last Bible study that the word charity means love. So he's saying, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he's saying prophesying is more important than certain spiritual gifts. Because when we look up the word prophesy in the Strong's Exhausted Concordance of the Holy Bible, it is the Greek word 4395, which comes from another Greek word. It means to foretell events, divine, speak under inspiration, exercise the prophetic office. Okay? He says in verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it, which means but, in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So he's saying, if you speak in a tongue or a language that's not known to man, it, what good is it? The only one who understands you is God. Uh, when we look up the word tongue in the Strong's Concordance, it's the Greek word 1100 pronounced glossa, and it says of an uncertain affinity, the tongue, by, by implication, a language, specifically one naturally unacquired. So there were gifts of tongues given that were known to men, languages that they didn't have to go to school to learn, like at Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out, they heard these people speaking these languages that they knew they hadn't learned. And then there are the heavenly languages, the, the languages of angels, which are unknown to men. And so he says, if you have that gift and you're speaking to a man, what good is it? Only one understands is God. He says in verse 3, he says, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Okay, the person who foretells future events uh, being, you know, revealed through the word of God, of course, because every time you and I tell people Jesus is coming back, we are prophesying. Oh, yes, we are, because it's going to happen. So he says the person who prophesies, he's building people up, he's exhorting, and he's giving comfort. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, the word edifieth means to build up somebody. So if you do have the gift of tongues, speaking in an unknown tongue, you're going to see as we go through this chapter how it's supposed to be used, you know. And so he says prophesying is more beneficial to the church. Okay, verse 5. He says, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So Paul says, I wish you all could speak with tongues, but the person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks with tongues. Because he says, if you're speaking an unknown tongue and you don't even know what you're saying, you can't even interpret to tell people what you're saying. So he said, if you can't interpret, it's no good. Okay, and we're going to see some people had both gifts, the gift of tongues and interpretation, and then there were people who had the gift of interpreting, and there was the people who had the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is the ability to speak a language you didn't go to school to learn, be it a human language or the language of angels, a heavenly language. And if you don't understand it, it's supposed to be just between you and God, unless there's an interpreter. 
And he's going to point that out a, a couple of times in this chapter. So he says in verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? He says, if I come talking in tongues and, and you don't understand it, what good is it? He says in verse 7, And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is pipe or harp? So he's trying to get them the reason because they were not using this gift the way it was supposed to be used. So he says, even things that don't have life have different sounds. Like if I strum the strings on a good guitar, they're going to make a certain sound. If I hit a couple of keys on the piano, it's going to make a different sound. Uh, he said in verse 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Uh, back in that time, they would have watchmen on the wall looking for the enemy. And if he saw the enemy coming, he would blow the trumpet, and people heard that distinct sound, and they knew what it meant. So that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. So he's letting them know there's a right way and a wrong way to use the gift of tongues. If you're in here speaking these unknown tongues and there's no interpreter, you're not supposed to be doing that because nobody's understanding and nobody's being built up. He says in verse 10, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them without signification. So God has given us all the ability to speak and all voices are different, he's saying. All of them have their own unique sound. You know, I can hear my wife talking in the, in the other room with some sisters, and I know her voice. And I can hear some of her friends that I know. Oh, now Melanie's talking, or now uh, Yvette's talking. So this is what he's talking about. All the voices have a different sound. Um, that's why the FBI and the CIA can find criminals a lot of times just through voice recognition. Um, 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. He says, if I don't understand what he's saying, I'm going to be a barbarian to him. He's going to be a barbarian to me. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He says you need to be focused on the church. Don't be so fascinated with your gift that you forget what God gave it to you for. All gifts are given to build up other believers and, and uh, believers in the body of Christ. That's what edifying means. 13. He says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So if you do have this gift, you need to ask God to help you understand what you're saying. He says, if you have the gift of speaking in tongues, ask God to help you understand what you're saying. Uh, verse 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So Paul said, if I don't have the gift of interpretation, I could be praying in an unknown tongue, but I don't even know what I'm saying. Verse 15, he says, what is it then? He says, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Paul had both gifts, the gift of tongue and the gift of interpreting, okay, those tongues. 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving up thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. So he's saying, if you're speaking in the spirit and speaking the unknown tongue in a room and the other people don't know what you're saying, they can't even say amen. 17. For thou verily giveth thanks well, but the other is not edified. He said, you are giving thanks to God in that unknown tongue, but the other person ain't built up. So you're going to see in a few seconds that he's saying 
He, if you have that gift and there's no interpreter, then you keep it to yourself. You talk to God privately. You're not supposed to be blurting out in the congregation if you don't have the gift of interpretation or if there's not someone with that gift there. Okay? He says in verse 18, that was 17, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all, Paul says. Uh, 18, 19. Yet in the church... I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Paul says, I speak more tongues than all of you. But when it comes to the church, which is not a building, but that's when you're among the believers, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. He says in verse 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding how be it, which means but, in malice. Malice is when you wish harm to someone. But in malice be ye children. But in understanding be men. Okay? He says you should want to be a child when it comes to doing something evil. But don't be like that when it comes to understanding. He says in verse 21, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and, and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So he took him to the word of God to show him something. He says in verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe. Listen to this, saints. But to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So you'll hear a lot of so-called preachers today tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul just said, tongues is a sign not to those who believe, but to those who don't believe. And then he said, prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So it's just the opposite of what they're telling you. Because I know there's a lot of preachers out there doing that and encouraging people to pretend like they're speaking in tongues. Every time you hear a person uh, babbling out a bunch of stuff, a lot of times it's not the real thing. It's just because they uh, have so much pressure put on them from their church and their pastor that they have to do this, and they see other people pr uh, pretending to be talking in tongues, so they start doing it too. The Bible says in all you're getting, get an understanding, all right? Anyway, Verse 23, he says, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? And yes, they will. You know, a person that don't know anything about God comes in and sees a bunch of people babbling a bunch of stuff, and he can't understand nothing that nobody's saying, He's going to think they're all crazy. Uh, verse 24, he says, But if all prophesy, if everybody's talking about Jesus coming back, and there come in one that believeth not, and one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Uh, 25, And thus the secrets of his heart are manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. So Paul says if everybody in there talking in a language that they understand about the Lord, that is more beneficial to convert someone, okay? So you got to get into the word because you got a lot of people out here playing church and, and reverend standing up there babbling a bunch of stuff and this one's babbling and that one's babbling and everybody just having a babbling good old time. But here come a person coming seriously seeking God, and he sees all these people doing this stuff. He can't understand nothing they're doing. He may go out that door and never, ever come back, may never go to a real church. And so that's why if you do have the gift of tongues, you want to use it the way Paul says you're supposed to use it. He says in verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. 
Let all things be done unto edifying. He said, you all have these gifts, but you don't know how to use them to build each other up. And that's what God gave you the gifts for. He didn't give it to you just for your own personal edification. 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be done by two or at the most by three and that by chorus and let one interpret. You see that? The word interpret, when we look it up in the Strongs, it's 1329. It means to explain thoroughly by implication, to translate. So he said, if you legitimately have the gift of tongues, let it be spoke among two or three, and one of y'all should have the gift of interpretation. Because if you don't, then what's the point? He says in verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and God. You see that? So if you're going into a church and people are babbling out a bunch of stuff, blah, 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 and going on, and there's no interpreter there to tell you what they're saying, then they're playing church. And unfortunately, sometimes you'll have somebody babbling out a bunch of stuff, and going on, and, and you'll have somebody who decides they're going to pretend like they're interpreting. He said, blah, 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 blah. he just said, Jesus is coming blah, 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 back. So my brothers and sisters, I want you to get into the word and let the word get into you. Okay. Paul is saying there is a gift of tongues and this is the way it's supposed to be used in the church. There's no interpreter. That person is supposed to be quiet. And they just talk to God. So you should never see it unless there's an interpreter. And like I said, sometimes you see that and it's not even the real thing. Uh, verse 29. He says, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. So even among the prophets, there's order. You know, if two or three of them are talking, there should be one there who's testing the spirit holding it up to the word of God to see if what they're prophesying is in harmony with the word of God. Because God is never going to say anything that's not in harmony with what is written. Remember I said that. If somebody comes and gives you a prophecy that cannot be supported from scripture, that's a false prophet. So he says, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. 30. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first Hold his peace. Now, 31, for ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So even when you're prophesying, you do it decently and in order. If the spirit comes upon me, and another brother at the same time, and God's going to reveal something, one of us need to wait until that person has revealed what God has said, and then it's your turn, okay? Everything done decently and in order. If a spirit comes upon you that you cannot control, that is not God's spirit. That's some other kind of spirit. Because he just said in verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, the spirits of the prophets have to do what the prophets tell them. So if something takes control of you and you can't control it, that ain't God. You know, uh, I had a friend of mine told me he was praying and praying and he wanted to speak in tongues so bad. And then he said the spirit came upon him and he started blabbling out stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he couldn't even stop. He talked so long, the neighbors heard him and thought he was crazy, and his voice was sore and hurting, and he thought that was the gift of tongues. Uh -uh. God gives you gifts that you can control, okay? That's why Paul is telling these people how to use their gift. They do have control of the gift. If there's no interpreter there, he says, be quiet. Don't even talk in here. That means you have control. And so you want to be careful of wanting something and not understanding and opening yourself up to the wrong things. Verse 34, he says, Let the women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under 
obedience as also saith the law. 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, what Paul was speaking about was how these women were blurting out and, and dis, dis, uh, disrupting the service. He's not saying a woman can't come in and say, how you doing, brother, or praise the Lord. He's saying during the time that a man of God is teaching, they shouldn't be bombarding him with questions and disrupting it. That's why he said, you go home and ask your husband if you don't understand it. And that's true of men, too. Men shouldn't be blurting out when the man of God is talking and disrupting the service. So God does use women to preach and teach. But one thing they can't do, according to Scripture, is have authority over a man in a marriage or in the church. And so that's why there's no such thing as women pastors having authority over men. Like you see all these women today with these big churches and they got men under them. Well, that's not biblical. It's not supposed to be that way. And uh, if you're going to go by the word of God, then you would not be a man with a woman pastor. If you are, there's something very wrong. But I am not saying for one second that God doesn't use women because there's a such thing as women ministry. Now, if there's a woman who has a big old following and all the people under her authority are women, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, but the Bible says in Timothy that the woman cannot usurp authority over a man. So I have a Bible study on that. Is women pastors biblical? And I show you from Scripture how God uses women and how he doesn't use women. So I encourage you to study with me on that Bible study if you haven't already. Verse 36, Paul says, What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Now, you know, you acting like you're the only ones that the word comes from and that it, or the word came to. He says 30, in verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. He says, understand that I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm telling you exactly what the Lord told me to tell you. Uh, verse 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And that's important because you're going to get people who are ignorant. We are not called to debate or argue with somebody like that. You run into somebody who doesn't understand or want to refute the Bible and debate the Bible, you have nothing to do with that. Okay? You pray for that person and you move on. Verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Verse 40, that's, let all things be done decently and in order. So he's saying prophesying is, is more important than speaking in tongues. But he said, if God has given people that gift, don't forbid it as long as they do it the way Paul just said it's supposed to be done, decently and in order. If there's an interpreter there, that's the way it's supposed to be done. If there's no interpreter, then you and I should never hear a person speaking in tongues in a church, okay? And if you have that gift, if there's no interpreter, then you should never speak to another person in tongues. That's a conversation between you and God only, okay? So if this particular Bible study has been a blessing to you, I encourage you to go to paypal.me slash Barton Porter and please make a financial contribution of any amount. Whatever you give will be a tremendous blessing to me in this ministry. And if you, like my faithful few followers, want to give on a monthly basis, I encourage you to go to patreon.com slash Barton underscore Porter. And whatever amount you give monthly is a tremendous blessing to me, even if it's just $5. I want you to know whatever you give is helping me to continue to produce these Bible studies and to get the true teachings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit out. And last but not least, if you like this particular shirt that I'm wearing, I encourage you to go to teespring.com slash stores slash Godware and check out the shirts that I designed for my videos. You know, if you like something that you see in that store, please purchase one 
because that will also be helping to support the ministry and giving you a tool that you can use in the spreading of the gospel, you know. So I believe that's the most important thing when it comes to these shirts. You know, you're walking around with something about Jesus on. The Lord could use that to plant a seed. And if you buy a shirt, you will also be supporting my favorite charity, Feed My Starving Children, because every time you buy a shirt, a portion of the money you spend is going to that charity. So if you have any Bible questions, you can leave it in the comment section underneath the video, or you can email me at bartonaaronporter at gmail.com. And also on the screen, there's a little circle up in one of the corners that you click. That's called a card. Uh, a card will pop out with one of the shirts on there and a link to the store. So you can get there that way, or you can just look it up on the internet, or you can go to the description section under the video because I have all my links in there too and you can get to the store that way. So until next time, this is Minister Barton Aaron Porter saying, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you all the days of your life and be sure not to miss the next Bible study when we go into the 15th chapter of this great book of First Corinthians. God bless you and goodbye.